Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of We Need to Talk. My guest today, well, what can I say? She is an Emmy award-winning actress, also a six-time Emmy-nominated actress and producer, two-time Latin Grammy winner, and a best-selling author. She's appeared on Broadway at the Sydney Opera House, Upright Citizens Brigade, Comedy Central Stage, just to name a few. And she's also been seen on CBS, PBS, CNN, NBC, and A&E. And throughout her busy schedule in life, she still has time to be a devoted wife and most importantly, a mom. She is someone who inspires me daily. And I know by the end of our talk, you will be inspired as well. Alicia Gaddis, welcome to the show. Hi. Oh my gosh. That, you made me, uh, I got embarrassed for a second. I feel the same way about you, first of all. Like, also, you do it and you always look fabulous doing oh. it, leading the world. And I, I'm grateful you. to be here. It's, yeah. We've, been, we've like, been friends for a really long time. I've known you I for know. like, Years, even yes. though I don't get to see you. Years. And I always say I want to be Alicia when I grow up. <laughs> Stop it. Stop. <laughs> but you know, as you said, like I am someone who is also a multi slash person, right? I do a lot of things in my life and I just thrive on being busy. And when I don't have anything to do, that's kind of when I go crazy. And I feel like that's the same probably for you. But how have you managed to keep like a sense of self throughout all of the, you know, directions that you're being pulled and when you're needed in different areas simultaneously? That's a really good question. I like, I think during the pandemic, especially caused me to have to um, really turn inward in a way that was just like uh, more aggressive, not aggressive, more, I guess I should say, see, I can't even do things like that. Like I should turn in more thoughtfully. Like I became obsessed. Like there was like self-care, self-care, this, that, this, that. Because as a multi it, as you know, you're like, how do I define myself? And yeah. I found like really, I mean, I'm a per- I'm one of those people who like everyday journals, everyday draws a tarot card, has crystals, does meditation, seeks therapy in workshops. Like I am like trying to balance self, you know, while there's all this output, like I have to also input at the same time. Does that make yeah. sense? No, it totally does. And I completely uh, align with that because, you know, I have to take my time to do like meditation and prayer and just be, you know, because even though we're in the hustle and bustle and we love doing all this work, if we don't stop, even just to pause for maybe even 30 seconds, it can catch up with us very quickly. And I know, you know, especially I feel like I'm coming out of it. This is actually my daughter's fourth day of kindergarten. Mm. And um, I was an emotional wreck. But I also am like, what do I do with time again and quiet? And I know, you know, as a mother of a a young child and I'm a stepmother, um, but as well. And so I've parented for about 13 years. Mm -hmm. So so now that with a young child and she was never in daycare or preschool, she would she traveled everywhere, went to shows with us, was always on set with me for good or bad. And I think that also caused me to lose a sense of self. Like the self was just like, you know, in these four days, I mean, I know that sounds crazy, but in four days, I'm like, let's get back to what I want to do. And I'm refusing to do housework (laughs) during while she's at school. I'm like refusing to do housework. I'm like, I can do housework when she's here during this little time slot that I have. I'm going to like re-examine what it is to make me whole in a new way, in an evolved way. That's super important. You know, just going back to talking about the pandemic and being with your family, is there anything that you learned about yourself during that time? Well, I think it's an interesting, it's interesting because I don't think my husband and I are like other relationships in terms of it didn't change anything for us with being with each other because Mm -hmm. we, we work together. We're in a band together. We travel together. And like I mentioned, like our kid or kids were with us all the time. So I think a lot of people had this outside life and not saying I have an outside life. I work on other projects, but truly we were used to very tight quarters in different countries and different places relying on each other and not having like really like a, a, I go to work at you know eight to six whatever the crazy hours are nine to five and then I have my then my work job and then I come home and I decompress and there's a compartmentalization and, you know as artists my my whole life is different every day and ebbing and flowing and my family was uh, th- part of that in structure for a reason so when yeah. the pandemic happens 
it didn't change the fact that we were together or I, I, cause I knew who my husband was. I wasn't like, Oh, you're this like, per like, who are you after 13 years? I only know you, on, you know, while we watch TV and, and yeah. 12 hours on the weekends, but more, I, I think the, the, uh, the outside pressure pressurized our household because we didn't have the outlets that we needed. We, we there were, we were dealing with big emotions in a, in a, in a pot that the lid was on versus like it, like having the babble of, the steam coming out we're always like goo, 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 goo. it's hot yeah. so that changed so that changed us because we had to take moments and be like oh we're not upset with each other we are upset with everything in the world right now yeah. you know, that, that was like i mean and even with myself like i had to be like you're not told, like you're like you're doing and i hate that saying you're doing the best you can because i always feel like we can do better and do more mm -hmm. truly, but that's me being kind of crazy but it's you know it's um I, we were we were doing the best we can like we're doing the best we really were doing the best we can absolutely i mean i think everybody kind of was during this yeah. year <laughs> right. now. like yeah, you're right you are just doing the best that you can because you don't really have much to do or places to go or many resources so i think that's exactly the best way to put it but going back to just working with your husband and being in a band together and you guys have you know won multiple awards been in magazines you've traveled the world how has that dynamic been and was children's music always the goal for you too well i think children's music was not always the goal for the two of us but i think that it led to the most incredible opportunities you know as artists we set ourselves up to saying yes we're yes people like yeah. you know yes to this opportunity yes to sing and i'm a uh, trained actress and i went to nyu for acting and tish and lucky's a trained uh, musician and so our talents naturally blended you know, it wasn't like we set out to like rule this world that we're in. But then when we were in it, we were like, well, if we're in it, we're going to do the best we can at yeah. it. And we yeah. have a natural care for children. And when I met Lucky, he was already a father. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it, that naturally lent, lent itself to what it became. And I think that, you know, I, I can't believe we've been able to do what we've been able to do in the way we, and I, and that the pandemic really showed us how lucky and fortunate we are always very grateful. Like both of us, our whole family has a gratitude practice. You know, when we sit down, we have prayer and gratitude. We are making grateful lists all the time. Like that is very essential to tell the universe and God and everything, how yeah. grateful you are, yeah. but you can still want more and also be grateful. That's a, Absolutely. you know, you can hold both of those things in your hands. You can want your best life and want to change it. And I think that helped us and propelled us too. We always wanted, you know, Lucky and I always want grand things. We want to see the world. We want to affect people. We want to meet people. And we've got an opportunity to do that with our art. And that is, you know, I can't, but I can believe, and I can't believe that both of the, that, that that's happened. Yeah. How do you think that children's music differs from just any other genre? Like, why do you think you have been so successful in this genre? Well, my husband says the greatest um, children's band of all time is the Beatles. Ah, so I love that. No real difference of like children's music and music for all. And I think that's why we've been successful mm -hmm. because we create music to, so I came from, I come from a stand up comedy background and they always say play to the highest intellect of the one, the highest level of intellect of your audience. Right. That's like, and, and how you do it differs of course, yeah. but in, in performance. So if, if you're taking that into the family genre, if you're, if you're keeping in mind that children are emotionally so in tune and so aware and so full and they haven't had the life experiences yet to cut them off emotionally and they're they're playing with magic and they're playing they're learning and they're these portals of of fabulousness like if you're playing to that mm -hmm. which is what we all want to be i think anyway yeah. then that kind of goes hand in hand so yeah, I think I think it it wasn't it was intentional when it began. We you know we tried to learn and evolve as much as we could as it happened. But um, 
Yeah, it's been an interesting, really exciting journey. Yeah, I've <laughs> loved watching you guys grow over the last few years mm-hmm. that I've known you. It's been really incredible. But, you know, as being parents in, and even in, you know, the children's music genre, and you see everything that's happening in the world around you, how are you and your husband choosing to raise your kids in terms of ex- when they're exposed to, you know, racial injustice, the pandemic, or just politics in general, because you really can't get away from it at this point. You know, you can shield your children from it a little bit, but in general, they're going to know certain things. So how are you choosing to have those conversations in your household about the things that are happening in the world? That's such a great question because I don't think that we should be escaping it. Um, And I think that we're raising our daughter in a very communicative environment where the conversation in our house, you know, like you said, it has to be talk to for children. You know, it has to be skewed, not skewed. It has to be catered yeah. for a little child's ears. But from the very, I mean, we've taken our daughter to Black Lives Matter in marches and she's postcarded with me for Georgia voting rights. Should we have, you know, but today, for example, like with, I mean, Afghanistan, we don't show her those news. When there was a riot on the Capitol, we didn't show her those images, yeah. but we talked to her about the injustices. She, you know, she had a shirt that said Harris and him, you know, like we are very, we're a very politically activated family and Mm -hmm. I definitely am. And she's come with me to activist groups and ally groups. And I'm also as a white woman have the privilege of, of not having repercussions that, that, I mean, and I'm very aware of my privilege. I'm very aware that what I, I, you know, that people may disagree with me, but it's not going to harm me. But I also have to be very aware that my daughter, I'm raising a mixed race child. So I can't speak to her in her situation. I'm going to try to continue to educate myself with um, other, other mothers and other persons who are, are doing the same thing. But I, so I'll, so I hope that she sees us continually activated in our unlearning and and learning and not making mistakes and trying to you know fix them but for example like i'll tell you melinda she went to her third day of kindergarten and she came back home and she had a great day and she said mama i really need to talk to you about something and i was like what baby you know and she said mama they only had a a bathroom for girls and a bathroom for boys Mm-hmm. And it made me uncomfortable because there was no bathroom for them or they. Mm-hmm. And that she's five. Oh, but, wow. And I said, well, do you want me to talk with some, like, is there someone who needs help? Let them know that we're a family that can, can, they can speak to her. Do you want me to write, a, a, you know, a, do you want me to email the school? You know, I wanted to see what, her, what action steps she felt was yeah. needed to. She said, she said, no, I just, I just, I just wondered why. And I, you know, we went through it, but I think she's being raised in where we have these conversations because they have to happen at home. She needs to be armed with, with love and, but love and answers and science. And, um, you know, so we're trying like, so that's, I mean, every day is a different evolution and how we try to parent her. And I'm learning as, as, as I go, as we all are, but I, I would say we're actively, active learners and doers into, you know, how to not protect her, but engage her with the tools she needs to go into the world because yeah. it's her world. And I, I want to fight harder. So it makes it better for her, you know, absolutely. Like that, that's, absolutely. that's how I feel. Yeah. I know you recently dealt with a situation where lucky was racially profiled. Yeah. And you posted that on your social media. And I know a lot of people came together to help and, and find out what was happening. And I think people know that that happens often, but it changes you when it becomes personal. So did that situation alter your perspective in any way now that it had happened to your husband, a member of your family? It's a good question. I think um, it was the first time lucky has chosen to publicly share it Mm. that it happened to him Mm. so as his wife it was not the first time where that has happened to my Mm. husband and so he it was just so bad and at a breaking point in the country as well that he 
I mean, I can't speak for him in his way, reasons, all the plethora of reasons for his sharing it. But I knew he, he wanted to share for those exact reasons that people are aware that it happens to someone, you know, because he hears all the time, well, you don't sound Mexican. You don't look this way. You don't, yeah. this is, it. what the, you know, but so I guess, you know, I mean, it's not the first time it's happened in our, in our home um, mm-hmm. to my husband. Um, but I, but him processing his trauma also allowed me to vocally, it gave me permission to uh, speak about it too, because it's not my experience. I am witnessing secondhand. So I, uh, you know, I, I try to be conscious of that. Like I, yeah. you know, so so yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it was, it's interesting when it does happen to someone close to you. Um, I, I, I think that that is a way to help people have empathy because I feel like mm-hmm. naturally there's a lot of people that think, well, oh, you know, I didn't know racism was a big deal. Well, it's, usually it's white people that are that are saying this because it's not part of their story or part of their narrative or part of their every day. So when right. you see it happen to someone close to you that you also probably in your way, don't deem as one of those other people, then you realize, oh, it really is just a skin tone issue. And it's not even about, I mean, he's a Grammy award winner. He's an incredibly successful musician. And then this happens all the time, apparently, didn't you know? You see the statistics of that that police department, that the ACLU, because that's what happened too. We, I wanted to like take action and like burn it down and just like I was yeah. like, like oh my god. But we we're working with the ACLU because this police police department literally pulls over. Uh, more persons of color, like 75 mm. percent more persons of color who are like 75 percent less likely to have done anything wrong. It's like and that's just like a micro issue. I mean, you know, it's uh, my rage burns because I I don't I couldn't fix it. You're right. Like when it happens to someone and it's there in your lap. But and I think that was one of the things, exactly what you're saying, is people kept being it like so really surprised people, really resonated when Lucky shared. I mean, we had people that were our friends, like who showed it to their older children because it was like shocking to them. And from you know, and you're asking me as like the uh, uh, the wife who's outside of it, who is a white work person, I have been I've seen it, so it didn't surprise me. It wasn't yeah. like a yeah. It horrified me. I was scared to death. I was on the, I was on mute hearing the whole thing happen with the police officers yeah. pulling him out of the car with drug dogs and strip searching him on the side of the road for literally nothing. He wasn't even speeding because he matched a profile, like, you know, driving while brown. And, like, you know, so, it, but it was hard for people to believe. And we had the, the one of the, not one of the tragic things, a, also a tragic thing because that was the most tragic yeah. is there were major fallouts with um, family members and friends of, of ours who thought that police officers were right. They were re- in my family, like in my family, you know, my closest family members took a stance to said, you know, made comments and I had to, uh, I don't have time for that. <laughs> like that's when I'm not going to change your mind. <laughs> like right. that's you like, just have to move like, on. You have to protect your family then. And that's you echoing back to when, how to communicate with our children at the time, Indiana was four and she was here for the whole unraveled it and had post trauma from it as well. But then speaking to the, you know, because we couldn't, we couldn't, we couldn't protect her in the moment, you know, so it couldn't uh, be something talked about the dinner table later as we unfolded it all. But, um, you know, uh, but she doesn't know the nitty gritty of then the family members and the fallouts. So I think that's where you start protecting your children with, with the with the smaller stuff, too, of like yeah. having to deal with the everyday trauma. Because we want to hold on to childhood youth. I mean, like we're lucky and I are working so hard to try to create things that bring joy. Like I've been working on this on these scripts for like yeah, it was it's been hard to create joy during all of this as i'm sure you have your own experiences yeah, with yeah, every absolutely. And, and racial wreck everything yeah. but it's like hard to make happy when there's so much dark like it's it's the constant struggle 
So, I, I mean, you, I mean, you speaking about losing family members and, and so on and so forth. Have you ever worried about consequences towards your career for being an activist and being an ally and speaking out about injustice? Well, no, honestly, I've been I, from the very beginning. I was, I mean, I was a double major in political science. I'm not trying to be like a martyr. Like, no, I don't worry about anything, but I, from like, I've always yeah, it's a real concern for some people and like they get scared about it. I literally, if, if, if the repercussions were going to happen, they would have already happened to me. Like, you know, like, I mean, from very early on, I marched against like when I lived in New York, I was marching against the war, pulling out of troops. I was, I, I was in marches against incarceration. There just wasn't like social media to share it. Yeah. You know, I've been, I've been like in gay pride parades. Like I am who I am all the time. There's been, there's been instances in my life where I don't have to show that when I'm at a kid, but we write, you know, I don't have to like, uh, get on the stage and say the, what I, those things in, in for children. But if you look at our music, if you look at the projects that we, pick if you look at the books that my husband and I write they reflect I hope a hundred percent our values our belief system yeah. and the justice and equality that we like really intentionally focus on yeah. you know so so if you look back if you're like you know I like one of my monologue books was the first LGBTQI plus monologue books for anyone any anything like that and like to me when I found that out, I was like what like yeah. that just seemed it's part of like who I am. So, and I think, you know, if you spend enough time with me, people will know that about me and I'm a very yeah. happy, positive person, but I'm very activated to my belief system. I, I grew up with a, a, I, yeah, it's just, you know, it runs deep. It's so always, are, yeah. and so it's like, I think if, if it, it, you know, maybe there, I mean, I'm sure there are opportunities I missed out on because I remember once someone told me um, when I was about ready to sign a book deal, they told me to tone down my social media and um, about, you know, different things. And this was like maybe four or five years ago. And I was like, nope, like, bye. <laughs> bye. We're not, we're not, a man. there was like a day. I was like, no. And then, you know, I've been scared. I've been, so I guess there's been moments of like, I guess, you know, to be honest, there's been fear of like, and I have experienced it. I, I, there was like a, I posted something like maybe a year and a half ago and made people like really angry mm -hmm. calling people out rather than like calling them in. I was just like, I'm tired of calling people in. Yeah. Like it was sometimes they don't come. <laughs> sometimes they don't come. And I'm a definite caller in her. So I was like, with that moment I had had, had a, you know, a breaking point and, um, people get mad and people won't like you. And that doesn't mean I'm going to stop or change the way I raise my children. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. How important do you think it is though, for people to get to your level of success or even beyond, or even if they're just starting out to use your platform to speak out about things that matter? Oh my gosh. It's huge. I mean, like my voice if there's any amplification of it because of where I am, like I said, I, I am not going to have the ramifications that are really going to injure me. I am yeah. like, that's like, I'm, I am a, a white privileged person. I'm speaking from a point of white privilege. That is just like, that's the truth. So if I can, so use your platform to amplify those voices those causes that don't have the amplification you know that's if there's anything i can do to do that that's what i'm going to do and i think it's like speaking from authentic self too i think that's so vital right yes. authentic self. yes it's like if you're putting out who you always are then then you're it's not like gonna be out of the blue people are gonna be like whoa what you know whether whatever that is with your personality what you want to do i mean I, I mean i think we've spoken about this before i'm a very public private person but i hold things very dear but i'm mm -hmm. very very open like if you're gonna like you and i'm gonna fail saying a lot of stuff i'll probably say something wrong and like i mean and i'll hope i'll wreck i'll deal with it and apologize you know it's like but we all do that that's part of like growing right and expanding yeah. and building but i think using our platforms i i mean i wish i truly wish that's been one of my like biggest goals is to have a bigger platform so that i can 
do more work. Mm-hmm. I mean, truly, I swear to God, I swear. That's like what I've always wanted to do, whether that was like, I used to say when I was really little, like I wanted to have a production company before I even knew what that was. <laughs> so that all my women friends could be together and that we would just create art. And if we happen to have babies, this was like literally I was like eight years old. I was like, if we happen to have babies, there's gonna be free childcare and then we can bring our kids to work. Like, and this was but like when I was little and I mean, I've been writing breastfeeding books and weaning books. Like I believe in community. I believe that like the amplification of like cause and voice together we have to help each other yeah. like you know and there's there's a lot happening and I obviously get very like jacked up because I'm like really want to make differences <laughs> like please just let me just let me make more can I just like do more I don't know but I'm with you I'm with you <laughs> but I want to go back and talk about your motherhood Jenny a little bit and talk about the books that you've written specifically Mama's Milk and Me what made you decide to to write that book because I know just having been a mom that did breastfeed there is such a stigma behind breastfeeding and just weaning and mother it in general like if people like unless you've been a mom like you literally do not understand <laughs> so what what kind of sparked you wanting to write this book and have this community and share with other mothers that's really nice of you to ask um well i'm not an expert and i always make that clear and when i speak usually about weaning and breastfeeding i always usually just speak with an expert usually my um, best friend mary farkas who's a perinatal therapist So writing the book, it wasn't from a medical perspective. It was more from the emotional perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I I just read this quote the other day that was like a meme or whatever. And it said, write the book you want to read because you're going to read it 70 times. Like that's how many, like, so I wrote the book I needed at the time. And Mm. when I was weaning Indiana and I would, you know, the term term extended breastfeeding is just a patriarchal term anyway. Like it's just breastfeeding. Like let's put a thing extended. Like verse like a geriatric pregnancy. Like, no, that's the patriarchy. Like let's just like change things. Yeah. You know, like overweight is just weight. It's like how much you weigh. Okay. It's like, yeah. just like, stop it. So, um, with this book, when I was weaning Indiana, there was no dialogue that was there. Like, there, there were like, there were like books about like weaning, but it was like a cat not having a mom's teat. And then there was like a whale, a baby whale, not having not milk. helping me. <laughs> and I was like, those are mammals. And, right. And then there's like technical books. I'm like, when you're weaning, like, you know, cry in your pillow. Just kidding. That wasn't on there. But it was like, I, I can't, I was started saying the same thing to her. Like, you know, there's going to be a few more, like there's, let's have a cat, a, a, a countdown. I'm very into calendars and I'm very type a checklist, <laughs> but just saying the same dialogue of like, you're strong, you know, mama's milk has done its job. We're going to still have these things. And we planned a set seven days, like a countdown. Mm. And at the end of it, we were like, okay, we're going to go have a, get a, go to the toy store and pick out whatever toy you want. And you get a cupcake and you get some almond milk and daddy and mama and, and you were going to have a party to celebrate how far we've all come together and that we're still together and have a new ritual, mm-hmm. you know, so a, a placement ritual because it's, it is, it's a special, it was, it was for me a very, very special time. I can't speak in generalities, but so I wrote, so when I started writing the book, the proposal I wrote to my agent was a paper long it was like one page of like I thought it was going to be kind of a board book so it was the dialogue of what I said to my daughter and then Mm -hmm. at the end what like kind of a fill in the blank page of what to say with with your child and they were like wow this would be a great workbook a a keepsake a memento you know because I think of all the things that I binge watched while I was nursing her at three o'clock in the morning or the thoughts I had and I wanted a book that was like a casual keepsake of this time in your life of you and your child's life uh, that that was special. And you could look back upon that was also help, hopefully helpful. Yeah. So it came. From that. That's so beautiful. I love that. I really, and how was the response to the book? It's been really special. I mean, I didn't, I honestly created it in a vacuum as you do most things. And yeah. And then, you know, 
Yeah, a lot of really emotional responses. A lot of mm. and then, um, Mary and I, who I mentioned, le- have been leading workshops, private workshops, and then some public workshops where we do prompts from the books. And then um, Mary answers like qu- questions about weaning. And she's like uh, also an incredible activist for mothering rights. And um, I don't want to, I don't know the medical terms, like about your body and like things, yeah, and yeah. all this stuff. And so yeah. she's really wonderful. And it's been these beautiful workshops um, where everyone ends up like crying and laughing and, and we've done all of them virtually because my book came out during the pandemic. So that that's hard. And then we've done this like virtual book tours during the pandemic and then the workshop, but it's been so, it's been so special. And I'm, I've had the great opportunity to be part of really special mom groups and just even giving that book when people need help is like, uh, I, I kind of been the go-to person where people are like, well, Alicia wrote this book if you're weaning, you know, and that's, that's special. They call it like an evergreen book. So it's just hopefully one of those books is like there and can continue to yeah. kind of like help people but I, I I honestly didn't anticipate the emotional response or the emotional feelings I would feel from mm-hmm. people sharing with me like yeah. you know when you're raw you're I was so I suffered from really bad postpartum anxiety mm-hmm. really bad like didn't leave my house I would have full panic attacks crossing the street mm-hmm. I constantly was worried like my baby was gonna get stolen like it was bad and so I I can relate to the raw vulnerability emotional you know often chemical imbalances that we are going through especially when we're weaning you know that's when your yeah. hormones are just like it's crazy oh, yeah all over the place crazy. yeah you're yeah. crazy so many people are either working or going back to work or so it's a compounded thing and um i've been very i've been very fortunate to, oh, to have been able to write it yeah thanks for asking <laughs> well of course of course i mean with all that you're doing and all that you have done and i know you said you're type a and you make lists so what are some goals <laughs> that you have for yourself <laughs> what are some goals that you have for yourself let's say in the next year oh well, and by the end of the year, I have to, I'm ri- finishing writing a screenplay. I have to, I have three scripts that I have to edit. Lucky and I are starting our first adult, in quotations, musical. Um, I like, so huge career goals, because I've been able to pivot to writing because the torrents, you know, dried up. Stop. So yeah, I've been able yeah. to really start really producing a lot of work, but I'd like to sell. I've, we've, I've uh, optioned my first movie, but I'd like it to sell. I'd like the company now to sell it. Yeah. <laughs> and I would like the company that bought it from us to sell it to someone else. Yes. And, I want it to be made. and I can't control that, but I'd like to manifest it. Yes. And I'd like to, you know, I just want to, um, like I, like I think which circles back to the beginning is really be back centered with who I am and that it is now not returning to self, not like putting it back together because we're all different. We all were like, we're all like shattered and broken and, and growing too. You know, there's yeah. this really beautiful, Oh gosh, there's this beautiful word in Japanese and it doesn't tran. I, it, it's like, you know, one of those things that has like a paragraph to translate into English and I don't want to say it wrong, but it's this beautiful thing where if um, a pot or a cup or a vase breaks, you don't throw it away. You, you mend it, but with gold, like mm. it's actually more seen as more beautiful because you put actual gold or mortar or something beautiful to enhance the cracks and then it becomes this it's also like if you go to a japanese tea ceremony there's lots of like pieces that aren't chipped they're all really meticulously put awkwardly back together and i kind of see myself and i'm giving myself time to heal while you know like that pot pottery there's mail here my dog got excited we also got a pandemic puppy (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's a whole other conversation that's a whole other conversation <laughs> well I love that I think that's beautiful and of course like I said I'm always so inspired by you and everything that you do can you let everyone know where they can follow you 
Oh, yes. My Instagram is Alicia Gaddis here. And I'm mostly there and on Facebook and then my website, which probably needs to be updated, <laughs> is AliciaGaddis.com. And our band is uh, the Lucky Band, uh, formerly known as Lucky D is in the Family Jam Band. That's where um, you can see or listen and see where we are. And then the show I just did during the pandemic is uh, called the Pandemic Playhouse. I play a puppet named Facty and that's on PBS right now. I love it. A woman of many, many talents. Alicia, thank you so much for joining me. That's really nice of you. Oh my gosh, of course. And to the listeners, make sure you subscribe to We Need to Talk and we'll talk to you again real soon. Bye.